systems, natural resource loss, and security issues. And we work with a diverse range of partners to really build solutions to these connected threats using a research to action model. Now, every one of us across the globe has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. The devastation has drawn attention to evidence that COVID-19 originated from an animal, most likely a bat. And this has led to renewed calls to increase global regulation and enforcement of wildlife trade and wet markets. In fact, a recent IPBS global assessment report found that 1.7 million undiscovered viruses are thought to exist in wild animals, half of which could spill over to humans. Unregulated wildlife trade is not only adding to the growth of health concerns, but it's increasing a global biodiversity crisis. And this is further exacerbated by the recent explosion of wildlife crimes. Fueled by criminal actors, wildlife crimes account for about 216 billion per year in illicit revenues and threatens the economic security and safety of people who depend on these animals and natural resources for their livelihoods. And these issues know no borders. Criminals exploit transboundary jurisdictional gaps and over the past year has also alerted us to the ease in which zoonotic diseases can move from country to country. So in response, the global initiative to end wildlife crime is encouraging states to fill gaps in international law to help end wildlife crime, safeguard biodiversity, and promote a one health approach to wildlife tr trade. Specifically, it is spearheading two efforts. First, create a new global agreement on wildlife crime by adding fourth protocol to the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, known as UNTOC. And UNTOC addresses transnational crime, focusing on trafficking issues, trafficking in person, migrant smuggling, and trafficking in arms. Many think transnational wildlife crimes should be added. Some worry the process will take too long and arrive too late. The second effort is to amend the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, as we call CITES. And it's to consider adding animal and human health to the decision-making process. Now, as we know, CITES is almost 50 years old and has been signed by over 180 countries. It regulates the trade of a large yet discrete number of endangered species of flora and fauna. Some think that after 50 years, it's needed, it really needs an upgrade and recognize that new issues affecting the world include health. Others do not. So as a champion of this initiative, the Stimson Center is providing a platform for stakeholders to engage and deliberate on the merits of each of these two proposals. And these are some of the questions that we're really gonna get into today. But before we jump into um, our discussion, let me provide you with an overview of our impressive uh, speakers on our panels. First, we're gonna hear from a Senate leader who has dedicated his work to protecting wildlife and safeguarding our environment, US Senator Chris Coons. We have been fortunate to have worked with Chris over the years, first on the End Wildlife Trafficking Act, which was signed into law in 2016, and more recently on the Maritime Safe Act, legislation to combat illegal fishing, which became law last year. So we also look forward to continuing our cooperation uh, with uh, Senator Coons in the Global Wildlife Health and Pandemic Prevention Act, which he introduced recently. After the Senator, we're going to hear from John Scanlon, the chairperson of the End Wildlife Crime Initiative and former Secretary General of CITES. John will provide us really with a great overview of the initiative. Then we'll move into our first panel who will focus on the proposed fourth protocol of UNTOC, and we'll hear from three distinguished speakers. First, Dr. Meredith Gore, who's an associate professor at the University of Maryland, excuse me, who will open with an assessment of the growing threat and transboundary problems posed by wildlife crime. Then we'll move to Marcus Asner, a partner at the law firm Arnold and Porter, who led in drafting the text of the fourth protocol. And he'll be followed by Christine Dawson, 
the director of the Office of Conservation and Water at the US State Department. And Christine will highlight issues for consideration with a fourth protocol. The second panel will focus on incorporating a One Health approach and amending CITES. Our experts there will include first Dr. Uh, David Quammen, the author of the book Spillover, and he'll talk about animal infections and the next human pandemic, and he'll begin really outlying these issues. After David, we'll hear from Craig Hoover, who is the vice president at the Association of Zoos and Aquaria, who led in the development of the CITES amendment draft text. And then third, we'll hear from Dr. Christina Voigt, a professor at law at the University of Oslo, who represents the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law. And Christina will present on how amending CITES could fill in the gaps in wildlife trade law. So after each panel discussion, we're gonna have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. So you can send in questions, please, we would hope you will, to the Q&A function. Now, before we turn it over to uh, Senator Coons, I'm now happy to introduce our co-host of today's event, Susan Lilas. Susan is the Executive Vice President of the ICCF Group. Susan and the ICCF Group have been tireless in their advocacy work around the world, really as global leaders working on international cons conservation. And we are so lucky to have them as our partner. Susan. Thank you, Sally. And ICCF is thrilled to host this event with the Stimson Center, which is providing a platform for a very timely and critically important conversation. So just a, a bit more about ICCF. Thank you, Sally, for the introduction. We serve as secretariat to the leadership of the Bipartisan International Conservation Caucus in the US Congress, as well as to 18 parliamentary conservation caucuses throughout Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, the UK, and others coming on board this year. And this work has demonstrated over and over how critical political will is to achieve transformative change. Since the start of the pandemic, we've hosted virtual briefings on issues such as wildlife trade, the origins of COVID-19, and preventing future pandemics, bringing together experts with policymakers in the US and around the world. In June, we became a founding member of the steering group of the Global Initiative to End Wildlife Crime, which as Sally mentioned, was created to encourage states to fill the existing gaps in international law. ICCF saw this as an imperative to encourage the real changes which are so necessary, and if adopted, would give us and the next generations a fighting chance of avoiding future wildlife-related pandemics and the devastating impacts associated with them. So conversations that End Wildlife Crime is holding with key countries across every region to discuss these proposed reforms are both positive and encouraging. And now at the start of a new administration in the US, the conversation here at home is timely. We all know that the US has a long history of leading and regulating wildlife trade and in the fight against illicit wildlife trafficking dating all the way back to the groundbreaking Lacey Act of the 1920s. In 1973, the US hosted the conference in which CITES or the Washington Convention, the first global agreement on international wildlife trade was adopted and the US was the first party to join the convention. And as has been evidenced in administration since wildlife trade and wildlife crime issues have been a bipartisan priority from President Obama's presidential task force to combat illegal wildlife trade, later codified by the End Wildlife Trafficking Act, to high level summits conducted both under the Obama and the Trump administrations, to the numerous hearings convened by Congress and to the volume of bipartisan legislation which continues to be introduced. Commitments to combat wildlife trafficking are certain to continue in the Biden administration and must continue to be a bipartisan priority. We believe that the reforms which will be discussed this morning offer the US an opportunity to further advance its strong and longstanding leadership. And now to our keynote speaker, a champion also in the International Conservation Caucus, Senator Chris Coons. <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Senator Chris Coons from Delaware. I'd like to thank Sally and everyone at the Stimson Center and the ICCF for hosting this important conversation and for working together on the global initiative to end wildlife crime. Panelists today, I'd like to thank you for sharing your insights and attendees for your attention to this important issue. In addition to providing critically needed resources to recover globally from the devastating toll of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have to take action to prepare for and prevent the next pandemic, including by ending wildlife crime. The United States has been a leader in combating wildlife crime for years, and I was proud to co-author the End Wildlife Trafficking Act with former Senator Jeff Flake. It was signed into law back in 2016. As you all know, wildlife trafficking is a serious organized crime matter and needs to be treated as one by the international community. We also have to broaden the conversation and consider practices that are unregulated. That's why I introduced the Global Wildlife Health and Pandemic Prevention Act last year with Senator Lindsey Graham to orchestrate a whole of government approach to closing high risk wildlife markets around the world. I'm encouraged by your discussion of a global initiative to end wildlife crime, and I'm looking forward to working with you, with my colleagues in Congress, and with the incoming Biden-Harris administration to advance this important, urgent, and bipartisan issue. Thank you. And thanks to Senator Coons. We are so fortunate to have that type of leadership in the, in the US Congress. And now I'd like to turn it over to John Scanlon. Great, good morning all and thank you Susan and thank you Sally and with many thanks to the Stimson Centre and ICCF group for hosting today's very timely event. We're also most grateful to Senator Chris Coons for his wonderful keynote address. We are all experiencing this COVID-19 pandemic together and it's reminded us in a devastating way of the interconnected nature of things, most particularly between economies, the environment, human and wildlife health and welfare. It's also reminded us of what the world's best scientists have been telling us for some time now. How we interact with wildlife is not just a conservation issue. It's also about public and animal health and welfare. And if we get it wrong, it can have massive global implications. David Quarman, who you're going to hear from shortly, has been sounding the alarm bells for decades. And the fact that viruses can spill over from certain wild animals to people through wildlife trade, markets and consumption is now very high in our collective consciousness. Now, as just Sally, Sally just said, late last year, the IPBS told us that 1.7 million undiscovered viruses are thought to exist in wild animals, of which about half could spill over to people. We need to take heed of what scientists are telling us. And as we battle this current pandemic, we also need to take steps to prevent the next one, as Senator Chris Coons just said, which could be even worse. This includes considering whether our current international legal framework is fit for purpose. The Global Initiative to End Wildlife Crime has done just that and concluded that our current international regime for regulating wildlife trade and combating wildlife crime, including illegal wildlife trade, is inadequate for both regulating the trade markets and consumption that pose a risk to public health, as well as for ending wildlife crime. We have identified two serious gaps in our international legal framework that must be filled if we are to give ourselves the best chance of avoiding future wildlife related pandemics and to end wildlife crime. Our initiative, which was launched on the 5th of June last year, was established to encourage and support states to fill these gaps through two interrelated, but not interdependent reforms. Firstly, to amend international wildlife trade laws to build public and animal health criteria into decision-making. And secondly, to create a new global agreement on wildlife crime. Our initiative is made up of a large and diverse group of people and organizations coming from across every region. We work through a steering group with international champions and supporters coming from across all sectors, as well as with special advisors. The 25 organizations currently supporting our initiative have very disparate views on many issues, but we all converge on the need to make these two critical reforms to our international laws. And I'll briefly take them through you and our panel will go into much greater detail. Looking first at legal, regulated and unregulated wildlife trade. CITES, the Global Wildlife Trade Regulator, was negotiated and signed back in the early 1970s. And it was designed to address the overexploitation of wildlife through international trade. 
and it developed a robust international regime to ensure that trade in a listed species did not threaten its survival. It's not perfect, but it does this quite well. But CITES was never designed to address the public and animal health aspects of wildlife trade. It addresses the impact of trade on the survival of a listed species at its source, not its potential impacts on human and animal health once taken and transported to other countries. Today, we need to take a One Health approach to wildlife trade. And states can do this by adopting amendments to CITES that build public and animal health criteria into its decision-making, thereby making CITES a contemporary and relevant convention for a post-COVID-19 world. And today you're going to hear from Craig Hoover and uh, Professor Christina Voigt on how CITES could be amended to achieve this objective and the process for doing so. And we're most grateful to Craig for leading the international team that has drafted a set of possible amendments. Now turning to wildlife trafficking. These are crimes that deprive governments of revenue, degrade ecosystems and their ability to sequester carbon and exacerbate corruption, insecurity and poverty and pose a threat to public and animal health. Illegal trade in CITES listed species is valued at about $20 billion annually but CITES covers just 38,000 of the world's 8 million species. And if we consider all species, including fish and timber species that are being trafficked and its impacts on ecosystems, the World Bank puts this figure at a staggering one to two trillion, that's trillion with a T, a year. And as more restrictions are placed on wildlife trade markets and consumption that could pose a risk to public health, we would need to scale up our enforcement efforts to ensure such activities do not simply move underground. However, notwithstanding these massive and highly destructive crimes, there is no global agreement on wildlife crime, as there is, for example, on human trafficking. CITES has been heavily re relied upon, but it was not designed to deal with wildlife crime. It's a trade-related convention, not a crime-related convention, and we've stretched its mandate to the limit. We need to do more. We need to consider all species being trafficked, not just the species protected under CITES, and to embed combating wildlife crime where it belongs, namely into the international criminal law framework. And states can do this by developing a fourth protocol on wildlife crime under the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. And today we'll hear from Marcus Asner and Dr. Meredith Gore on a draft protocol on wildlife crime to combat and prevent illicit wildlife trafficking. And we're most grateful to Marcus and his law firm, Arnold and Porter, for leading the international team that prepared this draft protocol. And we're also most grateful to Christine Dawson from the Department of State for joining this panel. And Christine has been a long-standing champion in the fight against wildlife trafficking. Colleagues, left as it is, our system is not going to prevent the next pandemic. It could in fact be raising our potential exposure to zoonotic diseases that can spill over from wild animals to people. CITES was groundbreaking in its day and our predecessors showed great ambition and courage to negotiate such an agreement in Washington DC in the 1970s. But it's now 2021, almost 50 years later, we live in a post COVID-19 world. We simply cannot allow a wildlife trade regime to prevail that fails to include public and animal health criteria into its decision-making nor can we stand by and watch wildlife crimes continue to escalate without scaling up our international response. The time, effort and resources needed to make our international legal framework fit for purpose in a post COVID-19 world is infinitesimal when compared to the impacts of a future pandemic and of wildlife crime. The youth of this world is taking a massive hit from this pandemic and we owe it to them to pass on a legal framework that is fit for purpose one that gives us our best chance of avoiding future wildlife related pandemics and of ending these highly destructive wildlife crimes. And in doing so, we need to show the same level of ambition and courage as our predecessors did back in the 1970s. And our initiative exists to encourage and offer support to states to consider and move ahead with these much needed reforms. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, thank you for that very clear uh, uh, overview of the, of the protocol um, and amending CITES and for your service over the many years and for really your passion and, 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 and for you know, looking to the future on what we really need to do. Um, so that with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our 
first panel um, that's going to discuss the uh, UNTOC protocol. And we'll start off with Dr. Meredith Gore from the University of Maryland. Thank you so much, Sally. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to the event organizers for inviting me to participate and contribute to what I'm really sure is going to be a fantastic discussion. So I'm a conservation social scientist and I have the privilege of collaborating with individuals around the world on issues surrounding conservation crime. Some of those conservation crimes relate to wildlife trafficking. So I'd like to speak to some of the science that I am engaged in with regards to wildlife trafficking. And so most people on this call know that illegal wildlife trade is not a new problem, um, but it is getting new attention in part because of the many transboundary dimensions associated with the crime. So what is so what are some of the problems associated with wildlife trafficking? Well, it's a cause and a consequence of social conflict around the world. There's violence against animals and people. As John said, it undermines the rule of law and creates new stressors for the law enforcement and criminal justice communities. It removes taxable revenue from legal trade and undermines sustainable development investments. Wildlife trafficking also magnifies environmental and social injustices, particularly for indigenous people in local communities. And finally, as we're going to discuss in more detail today, it also relates to biological invasions and zoonotic disease. So what are some of the defining characteristics of IWT today? What makes it so noteworthy? I think there's three characteristics. I'd like to share them here. The first is that wildlife trafficking is a globally distrib distributed crime. It does not know geographic boundaries, species boundaries, et cetera. It goes from protected areas in Madagascar to public lands in Michigan. Wildlife trafficking is also growing in diversity, scope, and scale. Again, wildlife trade has been going on since forever, and illegal wildlife trade is not a new issue. But today, we see wildlife trafficking booming. It's a growth economy. It touches trade-based money laundering. There's organized and systematic illicit supply chains that are involved around the globe. We see a diversified workforce. In many places in the world, wildlife trafficking is an opportunity for some individuals. We also see a diversified consumer base. Um, this term traditional medicine, where we sometimes see individuals consuming wildlife products for traditional medicine. Traditional may invoke ideas of older individuals or people who have historical uses for wildlife, but we often, we often now find youth who are engaged in finding new opportunities to use wildlife products. The final dimension of wildlife trafficking that I'd like to uh, identify here is this idea of boundaries. Wildlife trafficking is breaking boundaries. It's creating new connectivity. New people are being linked with new products from new places. Um, there are live animals being trafficked, cheetahs uh, for pets, turtles and otters, plants like orchids and cycads, insects. Um, there's really no species or genre or place in the world that is immune to this uh, criminal economy. And through the global pandemic and our increasing uh, you know, usage of the internet, these connections are, in, are, are increasing. So I'd like to speak a little bit more about this idea of how IWT is breaking boundaries. Um, most of you that know me know that I'm a chronic optimist. Um, so I will end with the benefits of how wildlife trade is breaking boundaries. But from a negative perspective, uh, wildlife trafficking is creating new pathways for zoonotic disease. Individuals that were not previously connected are now connected. And so there are these new exposure pathways. There's new transmission routes. Um, and these transmission routes can go from animals to humans, as we see with the COVID pandemic, and also from humans to other animals, right? We see mink and gorilla that have been infected with COVID, for example. So while illegal wildlife trade is also breaking barriers with the legal wildlife trade. So we have surveillance systems, we have legal supply chains, we have surveillance and monitoring at our airports, at our seaports, and our mail systems with our financial transactions that are online. And the illegal trade usurps the ability of the legal trade to function as it was designed. So another important dimension of how wildlife trafficking is breaking barriers is these di the divisions between 
individuals that are in positions of power with marginalized and vulnerable communities. So how is wildlife trafficking breaking boundaries in a good way? Well, I think this conversation here today is emblematic of how there are new collaborations, new opportunities to coordinate, and new opportunities to share information. Um, for example, you see the African Union Commission, which is um, working across member states and ministers of environment to coordinate their monitoring and enforcement, um, excuse me, monitoring and evaluation of their various strategies um, to prevent and combat wildlife trafficking. I see communities, for example, uh, sea cucumber fishing communities in Yucatan, Mexico, um, that are working collaboratively with, a, with each other to design new prevent crime prevention um, programs. And I see scientists collaborating. Um, the National Science Foundation's Division of Civil Mechanical and Manufacturing Innovation is supporting some of my research on illegal supply chains on pangolins, great apes, and dwarf crocodile trade in Central Africa, and also the linkages between virtual crime and virtual wildlife crime or crime that's occurring in virtual spaces with what's happening in physical or in real life um, situations. So these types of broken boundaries, I think, are a good thing. And I think one of the dimensions that we're going to be able to discuss here, hopefully today, involves those collaborations. So, so what? What do these broken boundaries mean? Right now, it's really challenging to address the interconnectedness of, of wildlife trafficking. It's really hard to enable benefits from these broken boundaries. It's challenging to leverage information exchange. It's challenging for coordination and cooperation. And so to the extent that we can facilitate those benefits from broken boundaries, I think we'll be able to move the needle on wildlife trafficking prevention and response. So, I'm really happy to pass it on to the next panelist. And again, thank you so much to everybody for joining today and contributing to this important conversation. Thank you, Meredith. Um, excellent, excellent presentation. Um, our next speaker is Marcus As with uh, Arnold and Porner. Well, thank you very much for having me today. And thank you, Meredith, for that great overview. So the protocol that we're proposing uh, together with ICCF and, and wildlife crime is on the, the internet and uh, in particular on the, the website of End Wildlife Crime and I think ICCF as well. Um, I don't wanna go through the whole protocol because it is massive um, and it's got a lot of different moving parts to it, but I wanna get right to the meat of what I think is really the, the most important part of it. And that is article five. And I'm going to focus specifically on Article 5.1. And um, Meredith is the academic, I'm the lawyer on the panel, uh, and, and Christine is the, the diplomat, but I'm going to focus on the legal side of it. So Article 5.1 makes it or calls for states to adopt legislation making it a crime to intentionally traffic in wildlife, and that includes flora and fauna when you crawl through all of this, knowing that the wildlife was taken, possessed, distributed, purchased, or sold in violation of either an international agreement or any domestic or foreign law. Okay, that is a lot of legal words. Let me unpack it a moment. So the way I think about it is really this is a two-step approach. The first is, is there an underlying predicate law violation? Was there a thing that is illegal? So in other words, if an animal or a tree or, or um, a fish was taken in violation of law, whether that is an international treaty or whether it's a local state law somewhere in Kansas, if that is taken in violation of law, then the thing becomes illegal. And I call that the predicate violation. Then the second inquiry is, is that thing that is now illegal being traded in some way? Is it imported, exported, transported, sold, acquired? A whole list of verbs there. And that becomes the violation. All right, now there's two components that are very important from a legal point of view. And we call those in, in the law, and a lot of you know this, a lot of you are lawyers, but we call it the mens rea component. And there are two mens rea components. First off, you are only guilty of the crime if you are intentionally trafficking in the, the goods. So if for whatever reason, somebody puts 
some illegal stuff in your car and you're going across the border, you're not guilty unless you intentionally intended to do that, uh, meant to do that. Um, second, you have to know that the underlying thing is illegal. Um, you may be selling fish at a fish market and it turns out it's illegal, but you didn't know it was illegal, you are not guilty. But if you intentionally are trading in something that you knew is illegal, then you would be guilty of the crime. Um, now, so again, it, a, mist a mistake, if you make a mistake here, you're not going to be necessarily guilty of a crime. You're not going to be guilty of a crime. Now, what about the underlying predicate law? Can it be any law? Could you be found guilty if somebody is speeding? And the answer is no. The underlying predicate law has to be a conservation law, a law that is designed to protect species, um, whether it's flora or fauna. Another point that's important is um, what if somebody else is doing the poaching, say in Zimbabwe, and you know that they were poaching and you're trying to sell whatever it was in Oklahoma. Um, you can then still be guilty even if you yourself were not doing the poaching because the thing itself becomes illegal once it was illegally poached in Zimbabwe. You knowing that it was illegal are trading in it in, in, uh, in Oklahoma and therefore you would be guilty. However, if you didn't know that it was illegally poached in Zimbabwe, you would be innocent. All right, so why do we like this? Why did we focus on this? Um, what's wrong with just going with CITES? And the answer in my mind is, is that the great advantage of this approach is that it is species agnostic. The vast majority of species out there that are regulated in this world are not threatened or endangered, at least not to the level that they're listed in, spite, in, in CITES. Um, and the advantage of this then is that um, if you have something to, that's regulated, such as for example, the halibut fisheries in Alaska or logging somewhere in the, in the Rocky Mountains, it's regulated, but it's not prohibited. Um, what you end up doing is you bolster the ability of countries to police the, um, the people who are cheating on those regulations. And I think one of the panelists earlier talked about the, the numbers, a very small proportion of the species in the world that are actually being trafficked are covered by CITES. This covers the big gray area that is not covered by CITES. Um, it also furthers the principles of comedy. So what this does is if there is a country that is, that is um, wants to regulate its species um, or the, the harvesting of its species, but it knows that this is, that once you know, the poachers take the goods and then try and sell it in another country, what this does is it respects the fact that that other country is trying to regulate its own wildlife uh, flora and fauna, and this helps bolster that furthering the interests of comedy. And it also, as I think Meredith pointed out, is it really addresses um, the realities of wildlife trafficking. And that is, is that wildlife don't really know borders, they cross borders all the time, and the traffickers don't really respect the borders. And in fact, they exploit the borders because they believe that countries don't communicate well across borders. And so what this does is it plugs a big hole in the gap there. Um, and by the way, you know, we think it's brilliant, but we didn't invent this. This draws very much on the UNODC's guide for drafting legislation to combat wildlife crime. It also draws from statutes from Australia, Canada, China, the EU, uh, Vietnam, Japan, and of course, the United States Lacey Act. So with that, let me hand it back to you, Sally. Great, thank you so much, Marcus. Um, very, very technical and important to really understand what's being proposed. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Christine Dawson from the State Department. Christine. Thank you so much, Sally, with the Stimson Center, Susan with ICCF for hosting this important and timely discussion. I have to say, um, thank you, Meredith, for a fantastic introduction, and Marcus for, as you say, a very 
lawyerly exposition. And, and as he said, I am not a lawyer, nor am I a scientist. Um, but it is so great to see all of our colleagues of so long standing gathered together to advance our efforts to end the scourge of wildlife crime and the ever present threat of zoonotic disease. For those who don't know me, I lead the State Department office responsible for advancing U.S. government efforts, conservation efforts worldwide. We work closely with our sister agencies, USAID, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Department of Justice, NOAA, and a dozen more. And my team coordinates the U.S. whole of government response to wildlife crime. Together, we leverage U.S. expertise, best practices, capacity building, and training worldwide. And of course, my office as part of the State Department coordinates the overall international diplomatic efforts. Lest there be any doubt, the United States under the Biden-Harris administration will absolutely continue to be a global leader in the fight against wildlife crime. Thanks to the strong bipartisan support in Congress so eloquently expressed by Senator Coons earlier, the United States now provides upwards of $120 million a year directly for combating wildlife crime. This does not include the hundreds of millions of dollars we provide to our partners in related areas such as biodiversity conservation, community conservation and livelihoods, and capacity building across the natural resource management sectors and for science. Over the past several years, we've been fortunate to add a few more tools to our toolbox, but I wanna highlight the most recent, and that is the imposition of visa restrictions on known or suspected, and that is a really key difference, wildlife or timber traffickers and their immediate families. This is the first of its kind in the world visa restriction that specifically targets wildlife and timber trafficking. We believe this sends a clear message that those involved in these crimes are not welcome in the United States. And it will help to keep these criminals from using the United States for the despicable, illegal, and often deadly trade. We're already receiving information from our embassies around the world about who some of these traffickers are and should be subject to these restrictions. A number of my colleagues have mentioned the End Wildlife Trafficking Act, and I would commend to everyone the, 2000 and the 2020 End Act Report and Strategic Review. This is a good snapshot of some of the programs the US government is engaged in to combat wildlife trafficking. But I wanna briefly flag a few here as our efforts to enforce and prosecute under US and international law is pertinent to our discussion here. The Department of State's Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement works to build investigative, judicial, and prosecutorial capacity to combat wildlife trafficking around the world. And they run five world-class international law enforcement academies, training criminal justice partners worldwide. Since 2010, Congress has provided $2 million every year for Lacey Act training. And in 2021, Congress raised that to $4 million. This allows us to train under Lacey Act, working with our partners at USAID, the Department of Justice, the US Forest Service, and key stakeholders. In 2018, USAID became, began a multi-million dollar five-year program targeting natural resource corruption to address the corruption that threatens wildlife, fisheries, and forests. And a few years ago, we in the department lost, launched an initiative to look at the convergence of what we call conservation crimes, wildlife and timber trafficking, illegal fishing, and the illegal extraction and trade in gold, minerals, and precious gems. These crimes often occur together on the ground, and they converge with trafficking in persons, drugs, and weapons aided all the while by transnational organized criminal networks. Working with the Department of Treasury and the Financial Action Task Force, we're following the money. 
The Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Law Enforcement has 12 enforcement attaches stationed at key embassies around the world to support wild investigations on the ground. The Department of Justice, the FBI, Homeland Security, and DEA have liaisons at different embassies around the world. All of these law enforcement entities are part of Wildlife Trafficking Task Force task forces within key U.S. embassies. These are often headed by our ambassadors. And finally, we will continue our support for Regional Wildlife Enforcement Network, WENS, of which there are 13 now, and we will certainly continue to spark the global network of WENS with the critical help of IQIC. Now to the proposal before us, and as I said, I am definitely not a lawyer. I think that we all agree that UNTOC is one of the premier legal tools for international legal cooperation and for facilitating cooperation between and among criminal justice authorities when investigating and prosecuting criminals on a wide array of transnational organized crime. The adaptable nature of UNTOC means that additional protocols are unnecessary to address crime as long as states' parties have the political will to apply the provision of the convention. The convention drafters demonstrated considerable foresight in many respects, but particularly for including the, quote, serious crime, quote, provision of Article 2 to facilitate cooperation among states' parties on both existing and emerging crimes. Signatories to the convention knew at the time that it would be impossible to accurately predict what new forms of serious crime might emerge over the decades. So one might ask how the serious crime provision of Article 2 of UNTOC might be applied more proactively to address wildlife trafficking and related crimes. And certainly many on this in this forum have worked hard calling on other governments as the United States already has wildlife trafficking as a serious crime to do the same. The United States believes strongly that the inherent flexibility within UNTOC makes it the key framework for cooperation against any manner of serious crimes that have emerged since the signing two decades ago. In closing, I would note that the new administration has signaled a very strong positive interest in and commitment to environmental protection, environmental justice, and conservation. And although we are only five days into the Biden-Harris administration, many policies are already under review. I am confident that a ser serious proposal such as you have laid out, one that appears to put into the international legal framework the U.S. approach, thus requiring other governments to do what the United States already does, would receive a thorough and considered review. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine, and thank you for your years of service. And it, it's, it's so um, wonderful to hear that the Biden-Harris administration is planning to go fast forward and uh, really take these issues seriously and consider how we move the needle in a very positive way. So thank you. Um, with that, we have received a lot of questions, which is fantastic. Um, what I'm going to first do is uh, I have a question actually for Meredith, um, uh, if I may. Um, Meredith, you talked about wildlife trafficking as really the dark growth economy. Um, and when I think about it, you know, today individual states are struggling to combat wildlife trafficking with limited, limited financial resources and human capacity, uh, despite all the great things Chris talked about, um, there's still really an issue in many states. So do you think a call like this, if passed, would actually be enforceable and be able to make a difference? I think that's a really good question. Um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to provide my opinion on it. Um, I think that what I see is that there's a great opportunity for many of the uh, Marcus will have to correct me, I, action items or it, you know, as I read as I read the the draft protocol, you know, to be able to enforce information exchange and coordination and tra transboundary 
um, information hearing, particularly about the cases. I think there's, um, I, I think we need global leadership in that space. And then I think it will, it will be enforceable. I think that we just currently lack it. I know from a scientific perspective, we're collecting all sorts of data. We have a rising tide in information and we're not able to, to, to direct it in, in any way. And so I think, I think that there's great opportunity um, through, this, through this protocol amendment to be able to um, kind of harness the potential that's, that's already there. So yeah, I do think, and I do think that it's enforceable um, in, in that there's a lot of motivated individuals at state level that are, are, are motivated to, to do so. I hope that helps a little bit, but I also welcome Marcus and, 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 and Christine, if you have additional uh, feedback, I, I very much value your opinion. I, I, I think, I think you, you did a very good job with it. So I'm, I'm good. The same, I think you're, you're right there. There is so much information now. And I think that's one of the more heartening parts of it, even though given all the new information, we, we seem to be seeing that wildlife trafficking is, is rampant and increasing. But at the same time, a lot of that is because of all the great information and the networks that are out there. So, so having different ways to, to collect it and use it, I think that's where we are now. We have to be able to use it. If I can just add one more add on, you know, I do see that there's also, you know, to be able to get this whole of government, you know, to be able to have lawyers talking with conservationists, talking with computer scientists, talking with supply chain experts. Um, we're, you know, the, 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 the traffickers are, are adapting and they're being really dynamic in their behavior. And to be able to have all of this um, kind of unified effort, I think really uh, holds a lot of potential. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Meredith and everyone. I mean, uh, you know, a multi-pronged approach is what we're all gonna need because as you just pointed out, the, um, the wildlife criminals are so adaptive to what is going on around them. And we have to be, try to be one step ahead. Um, but let me ask, you know, um, Marcus, I have a question um, really, a, about um, the protocol. It appears that um, the protocol requires countries to enforce laws of other countries. I don't know if I quite have that correct, but if so, how does that square with, well, the accepted concepts of national sovereignty? Yeah, so my, my view is that it doesn't. Um, although a lot of critics of this sort of approach um, say that, but I think they misunderstand actually what is going on. Really, it's focused on domestic trafficking in something that is illegal. So, for example, um, if something has been illegally poached in Canada and then it's brought over to Wisconsin um, and it's then trafficked in Wisconsin, meaning it's sold at a store. So a deer is shot illegally in Canada and brought over to Wisconsin, then you're not enforcing Canada's law. What you're doing is a force enforcing US's law. And the US law is that you cannot trade in something that's illegal. And in a sense, it sounds really groundbreaking. In a sense, it's really not. If somebody steals cars in Italy, and brings them to the United States to try and sell them in the United States, that's illegal under US law for many, many, many years. So what it's doing is it's saying, we're not gonna allow illegal stuff to be traded in our country. Um, and the idea is, is that countries should support that because one, it's important for comedy because you don't want stuff stolen from one country to be traded in your country, but it also ends up supporting your own domestic markets. So the guy who's illegally poaching deer in Canada is undercutting people who might be selling venison that has been lawfully hunted, hunted in Wisconsin. So that's my take on it. Thank you, yeah, really leveling the playing field for the honest folks. Yeah, I think one way of looking at it really is, is that it supports domestic business people at the same time of helping conservation throughout the world. Right, got it. Um, Chris, I, another question um, for you. 
Now, you, you talked about that the U.S. would really uh, take, you know, provide serious consideration for um, this kind of UNTOC pr proposal. Um, what would that look like? For example, like what other agencies would you need to consult with? What would the process be? How, how would um, the U.S. government go about something like that? There are several levels something like that occurs on. The first level, of course, would be to engage the um, President's Task Force on Combating Wildlife Trafficking. And that is at least 17 agencies, and we've added a few more, and it would be a discussion at that level. And that includes, as you said, the Department of Justice, uh, the Department of the Interior, USAID, NOAA, Department of Defense, because they all have a role in helping us advance our efforts to combat wildlife trafficking. There are also, of course, within the Department of State, any time you look to negotiate a new agreement, amend an existing agreement in, in any way, um, try to address uh, an international agreement, particularly one that is legally binding, we have a very formal C-175 process the Department of State runs. And, and that is uh, documented, it, you know, it goes through, it's very deliberative. And, and it's the kind of thing that you use before you enter into a negotiation, just to ensure that what we are doing is, is in the best interest of the United States. Um, and it, it also, it looks at things too, about whether or not additional domestic legislation is required to implement it, sort of the, the many things you would have there. Very formal process. Well. We have sort of a follow-on question related to that, um, which comes from the Embassy of Vietnam. Um, they're curious if um, anyone has any comments on their efforts to date to combat wildlife crime and suggestions in how they can go about lawmaking to really address this issue. I guess I'll, I'll take that one on. Um, certainly we have a great bilateral relationship with Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam has made, uh, the government of Vietnam has made some, some real efforts um, to scale up their own enforcement as well. I mean, there's a ways to go. Everyone, everyone including the United States can improve um, along these lines. You know, Vietnam is, is addressing as well the uh, pandemic and is working to close its wildlife markets, which is something the United States government has also closed, called for just because they are where diseases emerge and spread quite quickly. Um, but like I said, I think there, we're, we're always happy to engage additionally, and we do have a number of vehicles where we engage directly with Vietnam, as well as with the other countries in, in that region because those are pretty porous borders. And so efforts we, we have underway under the Mekong US partnership is, is really helpful because we just tap into, again, foreign ministry, ministers of commerce, enforcement ministries, and, and it brings, brings those all together. I'll just add briefly that the protocol that we're proposing, section 5.1, is based in part upon uh, one of the statutes that, that Vietnam has in, in addition to some statutes from other countries and the UNODC suggested approach. At a very local level, um, universities in the United States are collaborating with universities in Vietnam. Vin University, um, you know, we're working on a number of collaborative projects where youth groups, women's organizations, um, and really, really focusing on community-based crime prevention activities. And so there's this real um, effort on the ground to engage, you know, students at Vietnamese universities in thinking about um, integrated approaches to conservation crime prevention and response. Right, thank you. Um, one of the questions we've received is very specific for, um, for Marcus. And um, the question is, is Instead, in, in Article 5 of the draft protocol, instead of intent, quote unquote intent, was there specific rationale for not imposing strict liability? Yes, uh, there is. And a, a lot of this really is um, trying to um, put things into the, cons uh, the construct of criminal law. 
Um, in most countries, um, strict liability for criminal law is something that is extremely rare. Um, or, you know, in many countries, it's um, it, you know, it's just not allowed under their versions of our due process clause. Um, and the idea is is that ultimately criminal law is focused on blaming people. Um, and you shouldn't be blamed for things that you do accidentally. So in the United States, in the Lacey Act, sort of the, the, the US version of this, there is a misdemeanor for violating a due care standard, effectively kind of a negligence type standard or a recklessness type standard. But um, because we're adopting a criminal standard, the thinking here was to be consistent with more universal concepts of criminal law, you have to intentionally traffic, and then you have to know that the thing is um, taken in violation of a, an international treaty or uh, a domestic law of another country or your own country. Okay. And we have another question here um, asking if there are concerns that the need to prove, to prove knowledge or intent, sort of what we were just talking about, will will lead to people engaged in illegal activities through a variety of loopholes. Are there gonna be many loopholes that folks will be able to drive through? I guess the answer is, look, I mean, that's always a challenge in any prosecution involving pretty much anything uh, because the standard pretty much for most prosecutions is a, a mens rea or a mental state standard of knowledge or intent. Um, so, you know, it's hard being a prosecutor. I spent nine years and it wasn't an easy job. Um, but, you know, the, the burden is on the prosecutor to prove knowledge and intent. And there's all the tricks of the trade that prosecutors have in establishing that somebody knew something. It's important when you're answering the question to look at the flip side um, of, you know, blaming somebody, charging something, somebody with a criminal act is a very serious thing. And we reserve that for the most compelling societal harms. Um, and we don't wanna do that lightly. Um, and so while the knowledge standard is difficult to prove, um, most of the traffickers are not doing this because they're just negligent or because they're careless. They're intentionally going out there and gathering contraband and trying to sell it locally. And oftentimes they're doing it by undercutting the local market. Um, so it, it's not as hard as you would think to really get the bad guys who are intentionally doing the bad things. Got it, okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and, you know, again, Meredith talked about adaptability of traffickers and staying ahead. So one of the areas that we've been hearing a lot about on a number of issues is really, um, Online, online wildlife trafficking. Um, so, what are some of the initiatives being um, taken to under to address international wildlife trafficking online, um, including you know really trying to locate and prosecute tra traffickers? And you know, let me any of you who uh, feel comfortable answering that. Sure, I'll take a start, and I'm going to apologize to to my colleagues. There is actually a uh, an ongoing initiative, a, a coalition, uh, Traffic International is, in, and the U.S. Um, office is involved. Google, uh, SB, uh, Alibaba, all of these came together, and what they're looking at are are ways how they how can they police it, how can they address this, how can they find it? Um, for for many many years, eBay has has prohibited the sale of ivory, but it's it's always hard. How do you track it? What does it mean? People get very uh, creative with the words they use to sell ivory online, and it it clearly is a big new, exp it's growing exponentially. So we work very closely with them on, on cybercrime, as well as using, using cyber technology that's being used in other crimes to look at it as well. But, and again, I apologize to our, our partners for not remembering the exact title of the coalition name, but it, it's out there and it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and let me just add to that is that there is you know, from a law enforcement perspective, it's important to think of this as not that different from other sorts of contraband and other sorts of trade. 
Um, and yes, the bad guys do historically use uh, the internet to trade contraband in wildlife. We saw that in the Wildlife Justice Commission presentation a few years ago, where a lot of the, the bad stuff was, was traded on the internet. Um, but people trade all sorts of bad stuff on the internet. And one advantage of that from a law enforcement perspective is, is that while people are trading, law enforcement can also monitor those websites. And that gives law enforcement a good avenue towards enforcing. I'll just say that the scientific community, we're working to you know, leverage machine learning and artificial intelligence um, algorithms, um, you know, under the AI for social good kind of banner and really try to identify, I mean, there's so much information available on the web. And so really identifying the information that can support successful, you know, interventions, you know, be them, be they educational or social marketing or, you know, legal or, or whatever. Um, so I think that's a, that's a growing, a growing space um, for scientific contribution and collaboration. Fantastic. Well, what a fantastic panel. I mean, thank you all for really setting the scene right on the ground and, and with really innovative ideas, Meredith. And um, Mark is taking, a, a, you know, legal issues and making it so that people like myself, lay people can really understand the importance and the steps. And of course, Chris, as always, thank you for really articulating and helping us understand what the US government is doing, what we're going to do, and for just, you know, staying forward leaning on all of these issues. So um, with that, I'm going to say thank you. And we're going to now turn it over to our next panel to discuss CITES. Thank you. Thank you. And also, let me also, I mean, we have received so many amazing questions. And I just apologize to everyone that we are not going to have time. But I'm trying to do my best to get to as many as possible. Um, now, our next panel um, will discuss uh, how to amend CITES and, and to incorporate the animal and human health issues into that kind of decision making. And we're going to start with um, David Quammen, who is the author of Spillover. David. Thank you, Sally. Um, thank you, ICCF. Thank you, Stimson Center. I'm really glad to be, um, to be part of this. Uh, with the, um, these good colleagues and my friend John Scanlon today. Uh, my job uh, here is to frame the context for you a little bit. Wildlife traffic, human health, what's the connection? Okay, so everything comes from somewhere and dangerous new viruses come from wildlife, come from wild animals. Uh, to be more specific, Dangerous new viruses capable of infecting humans, um, killing humans, spreading among humans come from wildlife, sometimes by way of um, domestic uh, livestock as an intermediary. So why is that? Well, it's because viruses can only live and reproduce in cellular creatures, in creatures composed of cells, animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, Archaeans, cellular creatures. Viruses can only replicate and live in as genetic parasites in cellular creatures. And uh, the viruses that live in animals, and in particular mammals, in some cases have the capacity to take hold in humans, as we've seen. Um, now, we live in a world of viruses. Viruses are a natural phenomenon. Viruses are everywhere. Uh, the figure 1.7 million different kinds of virus um, living in animals has been mentioned from the IPBES um, report. In mammals alone, it's estimated that there are 320,000 different kinds of viruses. Now, these are just guesses. These are just informed extrapolations. But um, what we should understand is that um, there are many, many viruses living peacefully, quietly, without causing symptoms in wild animals, um, mammals and birds of particular interest to us. Um, 
And those creatures are called the reservoir hosts. If a virus has lived for a million years in some species of monkey or some species of rodent, that creature is its reservoir host. How does a virus get from its reservoir host into humans? Well, it happens because of contact and in particular because of disruptive contact. We humans go into richly diverse ecosystems and we extract resources, we cut down trees, we build mining camps, we extract fossil fuels, we extract strategic minerals, and uh, sometimes we extract animals alive or dead. That sort of disruptive contact with wild animals gives the viruses carried by those wild animals the opportunity to spill over, to take hold in humans. Um, viruses don't seek us out, um, and the creatures that carry them generally don't seek us out. Bats don't seek us out. Monkeys don't seek us out. Porcupines don't seek us out to share their viruses with us. We go to them, we disrupt them, um, we kill them or capture them, and we give viruses the opportunity. The viruses aren't seeking us out either. Viruses, um, they don't run, they don't walk, they don't swim, they don't fly, um, they spill into humans, they don't climb into humans, um, and sometimes um, they take hold with great consequences. Um, there are four events that signal, in particular, the scope of consequences that can come from a virus spilling over from a single animal into a single human being. Uh, the first of those four, and I'm gonna talk about those four events. Uh, the first of those is the AIDS pandemic. We now know from very, very good molecular evidence that the, uh, the spillover of the simian virus that was the precursor to HIV-1, the pandemic strain, passed from a single chimpanzee into a single human, probably in the southeastern corner of Cameroon back around 1908 give or take a margin of error. Very different from the story that we think we know about the origins of the AIDS pandemic. And that event happened probably because um, a human being um, was hunting a chimpanzee for food and uh, killed it, uh, butchered it, and perhaps got blood in, chimpanzee blood in a cut. This is called the cut hunter hypothesis. This is an inferential story, but it is supported by the molecular evidence. Consequence of that, 33 million people dead of AIDS at this point, and another 38 million living with AIDS began with the spillover, one animal into one human, one virus. Ebola in 2014, again, um, a spillover probably in the southeastern corner of Guinea. Uh, we still don't know the reservoir host of Ebola. It's suspected to be a bat, probably a giant fruit bat. Um, we don't have the gold standard of evidence, but that's a strong inference. And that, that epidemic in West Africa, in the three countries of West Africa, that riveted and terrified the world during 2014 and 2015, um, began with the spillover from one animal into one human. COVID-19, here we are now. Um, 100 million cases, 2 million deaths. Again, it is suspected that this virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, comes ultimately from a bat, possibly, but not necessarily, by way of an intermediate animal, and, uh, and has gotten into humans very, very consequentially. Um, before I mention the fourth case, let me just note that um, these, what I'm describing are not necessarily, uh, particularly the first two instances of commercial trade, but the very best possible way to trigger an epidemic or a pandemic of a new dangerous viral disease is to take a wild animal alive and put it into a market chain. You couldn't think of a better way to trigger a spillover that might lead to a pandemic. So what's the fourth event that signals how consequential this can be? The fourth event is the next one because COVID-19 is not the last. There is another one coming. If we're lucky, we can contain it as an outbreak uh, 
or an epidemic in just a country or a few countries. And if we are unlucky, that single spillover from a wild animal, possibly trafficked into a human along the trafficking chain will be our next big one, our next global pandemic. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Wow. Um, thank you, David, for those very sobering uh, examples, but really bringing it home to many of us. Um, <clears throat> well, we'll next um, hear from um, Craig Hoover from the American Zoos and Aquaria. Craig. Thank you, Sally. And thank you to the Stimson Center and to ICCF for convening this session on such a critical and timely topic. I'd also like to thank Senator Coons, who we heard from at the outset, for his remarks and for continuing to be an unbending champion for efforts to combat wildlife trafficking and address wildlife trade that poses a health threat. As Sally noted, I'm currently the Executive Vice President of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and previously held several positions with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, including as the head of the U.S. CITES Management Authority. AZA was the first international champion for the global initiative to end wildlife crime, and I serve as a special advisor on CITES. I thought it would be useful to, to start with why we did so, specifically with regard to CITES. To me, the threshold question is whether there's a role for international agreements in addressing wildlife trafficking and zoonotic disease spread. I believe the answer to that question is yes. So then the next question is whether existing international agreements adequately address these issues. I believe the answer to that question is no. So what is the right path to getting to yes? So at AZA, we decided to lend our expertise, the voices of our 240 member zoos and aquariums in 13 countries and our 200 million annual visitors because we support and believe in the focused intention of this initiative and the achievable and impactful goals of adding a fourth protocol to UNTOC and amending CITES to address wildlife trade that poses a threat to public or animal health. Specifically with regard to CITES, we know this. Scientific research, as David described, indicates that COVID-19 was most likely transmitted to humans from its reservoir host, a horseshoe bat, perhaps via another immediate host species. We also believe it is highly likely that this spillover was associated with a wildlife market that was supplied at least in part by international trade. As David so expertly described, we know that past pandemics have been caused by wildlife related zoonotic diseases and the conditions that make spillover from animals to humans more likely. And we know that we should not be focused on preventing the last pandemic or the current pandemic, but the next one, because there will be a next one. Despite the risks to public and animal health of high risk wildlife trade markets and consumption habits, Current wildlife trade laws do not generally take into account public or animal health issues. So if you believe, as I do, that there is a role for an international agreement in stopping the next pandemic, if you believe, as I do, that more effective regulation of wildlife consumption and trade are an important means of stopping the next pandemic, if you believe, as I do, that there is no existing agreement that does so, we are left with two options. Create a new international agreement or amend an existing one. Neither of these options is easy. But if there was ever a time for us to do the hard thing, this would be it. I believe that amending CITES to widen its mandate to include wildlife trade that poses a threat to public and animal health is the most legally and politically viable path and would have the greatest impact. This is what we know. CITES is an existing body whose decisions already carry the weight of law in the 182 member countries, including the United States, and for any other country seeking trade with those members. It is truly a global regime. Since 1975, CITES has imposed a legal, enforceable regulatory regime that now prohibits trade in over 1,000 species and strictly regulates trade in more than 35,000 others. 
CITES carries the weight of law because its members must have their own implementing laws and regulations to conform to CITES requirements. Countries that fail to do so can be subject to sanctions, including trade bans. CITES already has formal relationships with the World Organization for Animal Health and the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and other relevant bodies. CITES has a ready-made regulatory and permitting regime that could be adapted to a broader mandate. Widening, widening CITES mandate could be done more quickly than negotiating a new legally binding and enforceable treaty with global coverage. As you can find in greater detail on the End Wildlife Crime website, we have proposed the possible amendments that we believe would be necessary to accomplish this goal of expanding CITES mandate to address wildlife trade that poses a health risk. CITES in its current form is focused on ensuring that wildlife trade is legal and sustainable. It does through, so through a system of permits and findings based on where the species is listed in the three appendices to CITES. Appendix one, species are generally at greatest conservation threat and are prohibited from commercial trade. Appendix two, species may be commercially traded if the treat is deemed legal and sustainable. Appendix three, species are listed by individual countries and require proof of origin and legality. We fully recognize that there are multiple approaches that could be considered to amend the convention text to achieve the objective of a one health approach. In our model, we offer one such approach involving a relatively modest set of substantive amendments to, and several minor technical amendments to the convention text that could be considered to achieve this objective. These amendments address the listing of species under the appendices, the issuing of permits and certificates authorizing trade, and the capture, captive breeding, and transport of wild animals of concern. They could be interpreted and applied to enable the parties to address the consumption of certain species and their sale in markets where there is a public or animal health concern. We're proposing a new Appendix 4 that would include all fauna species, the trade in which is considered to pose a risk to public or animal health that may be subject to strict regulation in order not to endanger public or animal health. Because the purpose of Appendix 4 would be to prevent trade that is a health risk rather than a focus on sustainability, it may include species that are already listed in one of the three CITES appendices. I encourage you to spend some time on the End Wildlife Crime website to review the proposed amendments to CITES and the frequently asked questions and other materials. I also encourage you to check out AZA's related initiative, Reduce the Risk, which you can find by searching Reduce the Risk on aza.org. We fully appreciate that there's no single solution to stopping that next pandemic. Rather, there are important steps that we can take to mitigate against repeating history. One of those steps is to take a One Health approach to wildlife trade. A viable legal framework already exists. To avert the next wildlife related pandemic, we must expand efforts to stop illegal wildlife trade and trade that poses a health risk. The world could move swiftly to amend societies to include a broader health-related mandate. We can do hard things. The world, its wildlife, its people, and its economy may depend on it. Thank you. Craig, thank you so much uh, for that very comprehensive um, and making a lot of sense out of what is a, a pretty technical um, uh, issue and, and, and the CITES Treaty. With that, I'm now gonna turn it over to um, Christine, Christina Voigt. Uh, and Christina, as, our, as I said, is a professor of law at uh, the University of Oslo and also represents the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law. Chris, Christina. Thank you very much, uh, Sally. And thanks to the Stenson Center and the ICCF group for organizing this very important event and the very, very interesting and important discussions today. Uh, thank you for inviting me, um, speaking on behalf, as you just said, of, of the IOCN World Commission on Environmental Law, who is a champion to the global initiative to end wildlife crime. Now, my talk basically complements quite a lot of the things just mentioned by Craig. 
I will say a couple of words about that gap that we have in international law when it comes to regulating wildlife for health purposes. I will then say a couple of words of how amending CITES may go ahead. And then finally, I'd like to offer five reflections. Now, first on that gap, well, it is pretty simple and pretty straightforward because current international wildlife trade law does not account for public and animal health risks caused by international trade in animals. CITES, as we just heard, aims at species conservation and it addresses trade that poses risk to species survival, but it does not address risk, cost, uh, uh, risk to health caused by such trade through the transmission of viruses and pathogens as explained so aptly by David. Um, there are very few international standards in this field and those standards that we have are not legally binding. So what we have is that states primarily are left to adopting unilateral measures that restrict trade for the purpose of protecting animal and or human life and health. And unilateral standards come with challenges. They pose, for example, the risk of running afoul of international trade regulation, uh, for example, under the World Trade Organization, and here I think of the General Agreement on Trade and Services, or the SBS Agreement on uh, Sanitary and Phytosanitary Measures, for example. Neither can unilateral measures effectively tackle organized transboundary trade chains through, for example, coordinated customs or enforcement measures. Now, the One Health approach is important in this context because it uh, helps to think about and establishing international standards. The FAO, the OIA and the World Health Organization, they are working on a tripartite response, as most of you perhaps know, but no binding uh, international legal standard has been developed yet. Another example are the international health regulations adopted by the World Health Organization. They are binding on 194 states, but they do not address international trade. Quite the opposite. They were designed uh, so as to minimize the interference with international trade. So in the absence of effective binding international standard, the question, as Craig already posed, is whether we can use existing treaties, for example, CITES, to amend or complement to address other risks caused by wildlife trade, such as risk to human and animal life and health. Now, why we are interested in looking at CITES is something that Craig already explained. How is this slightly different question? Um, the, the amendment, uh, and I'll come back to other possibilities, but an amendment would primarily aim at extending the purpose of the convention so as to include the protection of animal human uh, health by regulating trade in certain animal species that pose or might pose a risk to animal or human life or health. And the suggestion here, as we just heard, is the uh, addition of a fourth appendix which could list uh, fauna that pose such risk. Now, that would go into the convention itself, become a main text if we had an amendment. And then through uh, uh, resolutions later on, that could be then uh, further refined because resolutions could then adopt a list of species that could go into that appendix based on agreed criteria once we learn and understand more of the transmitted diseases that, uh, that David explained so aptly, including perhaps adopting a precautionary approach in those cases where no scientific certainty exists, but high risk exists. Now, if there were such an appendix, that means that trade should be or could be prohibited in general, trade in those with those species or species parts and derivative listed in appendix four, unless uh, parties comply with strict export or import licensing regulations that and also would need to be adopted as part of the amendment of the convention. 
Now, what would be the process or procedure be for such an amendment? And here we're quite fortunate because the convention itself uh, designs or prescribes a specific process for amendments in Article 17. Under this article, um, amendments to the convention can be proposed by at least one third of parties to the convention. There are currently 183 parties, which means one third would be 61 parties, which would need to put forward that proposed amendment. Now, ultimately, proposals to, amendment, to amend the convention are uh, it, up to the decision-making process of the party. It's a party-driven process, as all multilateral uh, processes are. Uh, it would rest with the parties, but to pass an amendment, to adopt an amendment, that would require it would require the adoption by a two-third majority, which are 122 parties to the convention that are present and voting. Now, an amendment would then enter into force after another two-thirds uh, of the parties, another 122 or the same one, it depends on how politically involved they are, have accepted the uh, amendment and it enters then into force 60 days thereafter for those parties who have accepted it. For additional resolutions or decisions by the conference of the parties, the COP, the general decision-making procedures for the COP apply, which means that decisions are taken by consensus and only in those situations where consensus cannot be reached, a vote, a two-third majority vote uh, would be necessary. Now, Craig already indicated that also other policy possibilities exist other than an amendment, for example, a separate protocol could be envisaged, uh, but there is no designed legal process for such a protocol. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. It only means that the relationship to the convention would need to be designed and defined in that protocol. Uh, and also the relationship to the uh, permitting processes, for example, to the compliance mechanisms and so forth established under the convention would have to be uh, negotiated and put in that protocol. It may also be possible to think about amending other agreements, for example, the CBD or the World Health Organization's uh, um, uh, uh, international health re regulations. It's possible, but CITES is perhaps the closest international agreement we have that relates to issues of wildlife trade in terms of its object and purpose, in terms of its structure, governments, uh, governance and permitting process. Let me finish by sharing just five brief reflections with you the, uh, on the advantages and slight disadvantages perhaps of an amendment. First one is the, the fact of compliance. The Convention on Societies has established a compliance um, mechanism. There's a standing committee that handles matters of compliance. And that mechanism would also apply, of course, to the amended convention that would not apply necessarily to an additional protocol. So it might make sense to look at the convention's amendments procedure rather than additional protocol if it may be of interest to parties to also apply the compliance mechanism to, to the uh, issue of uh, health risks. The second aspect I already alluded to in the very beginning is that relationship to international trade law, for example, under WTO or, or NAFTA, an international agreement like amended CITES on uh, species which pose a risk to human and animal life and health may make it easier to justify uh, international trade measures that may be um, uh, um, proposing a barrier to international trade, for example, trade bans, because then we would have an a multilaterally agreed standard, which is easily, uh, easier justifiable under international trade law. So that's a big plus to an amended uh, convention. Another reflection, of course, is that not only international trade, but also internal national trade contributes to that transmission of diseases from wild animals to human or other animals. That would, of course, not be addressed by CITES, by transboundary trade, but it's something that uh, uh, rests with the state sovereignty of each uh, individual state. But an international agreement like CITES in its amended form would, of course, also have a deterrent effect to domestic trade uh, chains. The fourth reflection is that about prevention, trade in itself is not the only reason, as we heard from Craig, 
for uh, David, I'm sorry, for the transmission of diseases. But of course, what we need is to leave wild places uh, on their own, uh, reduce taking, reduce uh, capture of wild animals. That is something that, of course, CITES uh, in its entirety cannot address. And here I just want to point to a very recent initiative by France. Uh, um, by, especially by the Ministry of Envi um, Education and the Foreign Ministry of France, who just at the One Planet uh, Summit for Biodiversity about uh, 10 days ago, launched the pre zoed uh, initiative. And that's an initiative to prevent emerging zoonotic diseases, uh, risks and pandemics. And it might be very interesting to see at the complementary possibilities of the initiatives here with that particular initiative by France. And finally, the last point is the political environment. As I said, an initiative like this needs political mobilization. 61 parties are necessary for a request for amendment. 122 parties are important to adopt it. 122 parties are important for it to enter into force. Now, this needs significant uh, diplomatic mobilization across the board in terms of establishing a consensus and agreement on the need for an amendment and on the final design of such a possible amendment that reaches out, that means reaching out really across the board to many different countries uh, that are engaged in these global supply chains. So a broad consensus by uh, diplomatic outreach, diplomatic efforts is probably a very significant, important uh, uh, um, as, uh, element of this initiative. It may save negotiation time and it may eventually make the international response much more effective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Wow. Uh, thank you for outlining the very extensive process to amend CITES and, and, and making it so that we all can understand uh, um, an important and complicated process. Um, so let me turn it over to um, some of the questions. We've, we've really received a lot of great questions. Um, let me first, Craig, this is a question for you. Um, one of our, our, our attendees has said that, you know, uh, CITES does an excellent job of regulating and combating illegal and you know, uh, wildlife trade. And they're wondering, um, would these kind of proposed changes detract from the existing business of CITES and the good work CITES is already doing? It's a, it's a great question. And, um, and certainly if you're of the view that CITES has historically been underfunded and understaffed, I, I frankly would wholeheartedly agree. Um, it's, it's clear that under the proposed changes also that, that, that we're, we've put forward, the workload of the convention, including its parties and the secretariat would increase. Um, but these changes are necessary to ensure that we take a One Health approach to wildlife trade to help uh, avoid future wildlife related pandemics. And, and I would add that by amending CITES, it puts the CITES parties in the driver's seat rather than having additional workload thrust upon the parties through separate agreements or separate mandates. And by taking on a strengthened mandate, CITES becomes a more relevant and contemporary agreement, leading efforts to prevent future wildlife tra trade related pandemics. Um, as such, one would expect the convention to attract new funding sources, including from health budgets. And certainly there's far more money going into um, international health issues than are going into international conservation issues. And so I think that that would bolster the ability to carry out all of, all of the CITES mandates. So rather than fragmenting CITES or detracting from its existing mandate or directing resources elsewhere, I would say institutionalizing one health approach to wildlife trade within the convention would strengthen CITES, its processes, and its financing. I'd argue that amending CITES and expanding its mandate makes it more relevant Strengthen, strengthens the treaty and the support it would receive. And the failure to do so would further marginalize it and disconnect it from what the world currently needs most. Great, thank you. Um, you know, another, uh, Christina, you, you, I mean, you highlighted how, um, how extensive the process is to amend um, CITES and open it up with so many um, signatories. We've received some questions um, asking about if opening up CITES uh, 
risks some of those countries that are already signatories to proposing other changes that in the end may actually weaken the convention? Is that something that's of concern? Uh, thank you, Sally. Um, that is, of course, always the, the first concern that, that um, people or countries would raise when it comes to amending an existing treaty. Now, as I, as I try to highlight, the process is quite well defined for CITES, where you have to have a proposal put forward by one third 61 member states, and that proposal would then be um, uh, elaborated by an extraordinary conference of the party, which would, which would only look at the proposal which was put forward. Now, that does not prevent other parties, if they also gain one third uh, support, to put forward uh, complementary or conflicting proposals. That is something that is always possible. But the likelihood that another one third of the parties to the uh, to societies would actually mobilize that support for a contravening proposal is, is rather uh, limited. So I think the, the possibility to, to garner that support of one, one third of the parties and then keep the negotiations focused on that proposal is much higher than, than having to deal with alternative uh, proposals. Great, thank you. Kelly, if um, I could just add to what Christina oh, said. Um, as difficult as it may be, uh, if it's ever going to be done, this is the moment. Well, David, that, that's a perfect segue into a question um, that I have for you, which is um, simply put, how vulnerable do you think we are right now to the next pandemic? And do you think what we're proposing will actually prevent that kind of a pandemic? Um, I'll take the second part first. What we're proposing, what is being proposed, certainly will help enormously uh, to lower the odds of the next um, the next pandemic um, in terms of whether we are vulnerable. Yes, we are vulnerable. I would go back to what I think I said about the different stages of event spillover. A new virus or other pathogen passes from its from its animal host into its first human victim. If it in, if it infects, you know, two or three dozen people in a remote place somewhere. That's an outbreak. If it spreads from that remote place in Eastern Guinea or the Four Corners area of the US or wherever, China, um, and crosses a country, it's an epidemic. And if it gets onto an airport and spreads across the world, it's a pandemic. We all understand that. But there are different points at which we can prevent one of those events from turning into the next event. And probably the most important point is between, we can't prevent spillovers from happening as long as humans are interacting with wild animals. We can, uh, spillovers will turn into outbreaks, but we can prevent outbreaks from turning into epidemics and pandemics with good international agreement, capacity building in all of the countries where there is wildlife, which is everywhere, um, capacity building, um, to produce new public health experts, new molecular biologists, people who can do diagnostics, people who can, who can go to an outbreak and find out very quickly whether there is a new pathogen, a new virus involved here. If so, what kind of virus sequence the genome, um, trigger international cooperation in terms of uh, control of the spread of that, in terms of the supply of material and experts to that outbreak point. We can prevent out the next outbreak from becoming the next pandemic. Um, we need four things. We need the science. We have the science. We need the public health expertise. We have the public health expertise. We need good national leadership. For the last four years, we have not had that. Um, and we need buy-in from communities, from citizens. And in the United States, at least, we have not had that during COVID-19. So we need all four of those things, not just two or three of them uh, to protect us from the next pandemic. Well, the, you raised some really important issues there. And you know, one of them, uh, as you just noted, is about educating uh, the general public. I mean, how do you, either David or Craig, because I know that AZA does a lot of this as well, how do you think that um, 
we can really do better with community education to um, how can it be improved on wildlife trafficking, the threat to people's health and One Health as a whole? Do you think One Health education, we should start with younger people or elders in communities? I mean, what are some of the steps you would recommend we take uh, initially? Craig, do you wanna jump in first? Sure, sure I'll start and, and, and I would say yes. Uh, yes to all of those things. Um, it's important to engage um, younger people. It's important to engage influencers. And it's important to recognize what works and what doesn't work, which means you have to test and you have to evaluate how your messaging lands with people and you have to adapt accordingly rather than just continuing to do the same thing over and over again without evaluating how, it, how impactful it is. And so we need to be strategic. We need to, to draw in, in the right expertise, social scientists, et cetera. Meredith, I'm sure could speak to this issue very well. Um, as well, um, but it's, an, it's all of the above and it's recognizing that different messages will influence people differently um, uh, depending on how you approach it. And we see this with zoos and aquariums with getting people to wear masks. The, the messaging is different um, in different parts of the United States even. And so just recognizing what works and what doesn't and adapting accordingly. I agree with everything Craig said, and I'll just add four more words for emphasis. Teach the children science. Sorry about Sally, that. we lost you. Yep, sorry. Oh, um, yeah, good. Yeah, very good point. Um, and, and so, um, let me also ask, um, this sort of goes back to um, CITES in general. I mean, how, how would we think about amending CITES to include all wildlife species or be amended to include non-endangered species since that's the focus? You know, how would we determine which species really provides the threat to public health? Sure, I'll start and I'll say that um, certainly um, it's going to require consultation and bringing in new expertise, right? CITES, the focus now is on legal and sustainable. And so the, the voices who influence what goes in the CITES appendices are those who have that background and expertise. And if we're going to add a fourth appendix, if we're going to list species that are a threat to public or animal health, we're going to have to bring in different expertise and it's going to involve different government agencies and different voices, but that, that expertise exists. It's out there. Um, the ability to develop criteria for what species to list, there's, there's um, knowledge in, in history there as well. This is, this is very doable. It's going to uh, involve some adapting and um, bringing in um, new voices, but it, it, it all, all those people are, exist and that they just need to be brought into the fold. Consultation with OIE, consultation with the World Health Organization, all of those things will be important um, in that process. Well, we have time for one more question. Um, and I think this is, uh, could go to everyone really. Um, we've, we've received some great questions about how can um, NGO and other nonprofit um, entities get involved with the initiative and how can citizen action really step up to help enforce statutes, but also to support the overall and wildlife crime initiative. Um, let me ask all, all three of you if you have comments on that. I'll defer to the other two panelists. <laughs> Well, I'll start, um, and that is to say that um, I'll, I'll put it in the context of the United States and how the, how the U.S. approaches engagement in CITES, and that is it's a very public and open process that welcomes public input. And so I would say whether you are an interested uh, conservation organization or another NGO or a member of the interested public, you should be engaging um, the agencies that are responsible for implementing CITES in the United States, including the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and um, the U.S. Department of State and um, engaging uh, legislators as, as well. Um, have, make sure your voice is heard, um, that uh, these changes are things that you see as, as positive and uh, something that you demand. 
Um, thank you. I was I was uh, about to comment something along the same lines as Craig just said. Um, the 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 possibility to participate as stakeholders in the international processes and the site is they are there to to make statements or be heard as as stakeholders. But much more important, really, is to influence the the respective parties, the countries in their domestic processes to get them behind a possible amendment of CITES and, and make, make sure and make clear the need for amending or expanding CITES as to uh, include uh, health risks. And that can go through domestic channels that, that might, might uh, um, be differing from country to country. Um, I just wanted to add one word to the previous question on, on how to include all wildlife um, into the purview of, of CITES. I, I don't think that exactly is, is the, the, the uh, aim of the initiative. Um, the, the aim is to include in that fourth appendix species that are not threatened by international trade, but who pose a threat to human health and, and human life and therefore need uh, to be listed uh, separately. But they can, of course, overlap with the uh, existing appendices. Um, and and as, as Craig already mentioned, that is something that will evolve or could evolve over time with our knowledge and, and experience evolving and that could be reflecting reflected in additional listing of species and specimen in, in that possible fourth uh, appendix. Okay, thank you. Um, if all of our panelists who participated today could please turn on their video, um, I just want to thank everyone for participating this morning, this afternoon, this evening on John, with regard to John. Um, you know, we received so many excellent questions and I again apologize for not being able to get to all of them. But um, I'd note, please look at the N Wildlife Crime Initiative, look at the website and that will help you if you want to get more involved. Um, there are, are great opportunities there. And let me just say, you know, really, this event is the start of a conversation that is so important about how to amend international laws to meet these challenges posed by wildlife crime and zoonotic disease spread. Um, you know, again, it's a process. It's a multi-dimensional process, government, stakeholder, um, uh, industry. And we at the Simpson Center are really proud to be able to serve as a convener and will continue to do so. And we're, we're so pleased to partner with ICCF and um, really come together to discuss these opportunities and challenges that are faced with both CITES and changing UNTOC and how we can effectively implement uh, these issues over the long term. I mean, gosh, it's so important and it's something we're facing square on every day right now. So we really kind of get it. Um, so with that, and on a positive note that we heard about a lot of great ideas, ways forward, you know, from all of our panelists, let me just say thank you and thanks to everyone who joined us today. And this has been recorded and it will be up on our website and I suspect it'll be up on ICCF's website soon. So please um, check us out and contact us if you have any